All right. Hey, everyone. It's nice to meet you uh, virtually. Unfortunately, we can't be in person, but my name's Rick, and uh, I'm down in the Lacey area. I work for the state, and uh, part of my background is IT and cybersecurity. And then our local YMCA, I approached him about providing a cybersecurity workshop this summer, well, actually a couple of years ago, and then some family events and COVID got in the way. So after about a year and a half, we finally aligned and I was able to offer that and word got out to your local Y. And well, here we are. So I'm going to try to share my screen. So I can find the right show. There it is. All right, tell me that you see a safe and secure online screen, seniors edition. Yep, we see it. All right, great. Well, without further ado, let's go ahead and get this party started. Um, so thanks to Tammy and the crew up there in Whatcom County to get this going. I appreciate their patience. It was a bit of work and I hope you enjoy the information. We only have an hour and this information that I'm delivering to you has been created and, and uh, developed by another organization, another group uh, called Center for Cybersecurity, Center for Cyber Safety and Education. And in collaboration with a uh, professional organization I'm a member of, which is pronounced ISC squared. They have uh, for parents, youth, and seniors, these informational workshops, uh, professionals can deliver it to their community to help them navigate and use internet in a more safe manner. So I appreciate your time and attention. I hope you find this information relevant and pertinent. Um, with uh, Elena, is that correct? Yes. All right, with Elena's help, She's going to monitor the chat because it's hard for me to do both and speak to you about this information. And then I believe there's also be an opportunity afterwards if you wish to share some questions with your staff and they'll try to work with me to find the answers as best we can and try to push that back out to you later. Excellent. Thank you. Right. So again, a little about myself. I spent 20 years in the Army. My final job was flying Black Hawk helicopters and that photos of me and my family right before our last flight when we lived in Korea. Um, once I retired, I was trying to find a new path in life outside of aviation, and I landed in security, went through UW's program, and now I work as an IT help desk. I spent some time as an IT auditor, and so I just like to take this knowledge I have and try to share it best I can because it can be a very unsettling experience for some people, if not dangerous, depending upon your, what you encounter uh, using the Internet. Some of the things I'll talk about here, there's no intent or implication that I'm promoting any of those. They're just ideas and recommendations that I can offer. And of course, please go ahead and conduct your own research, talk to your own family, friends, or professionals that you trust uh, for trying to find the, the best process or tool to help you be safe and secure online. I already covered this part at the beginning about chat being monitored by Elena. So without further ado, um, so many of us have uh, experienced some negative uh, have some exper negative experiences while using the internet or heard about someone that's had some something scary that's happened to them in the online world. Um, some may feel that it's kind of a hard place to navigate, get around. They think that there's dangers around every corner. And part of that is fed by a lot of bad people and criminals out there using the internet to prey on people like us. Uh, people who just want to use the internet for the benefits that it can provide us, our family, our lives, et cetera, and our professions. My goal is not to scare you away from the internet, uh, but just to help you become knowledgeable of some of the dangers, raise some awareness and provide some training on how you can find the internet a lot less scary and dangerous for you. Uh, for many of us, the internet has become an important part of our lives. Some of the benefits, like for example, when I was living overseas was keeping up with family and friends using social media. Uh, my kids enjoy it when to play some of the online games like Minecraft and whatnot, or you know, searching for new things to learn about, whether it's languages, uh, my wife enjoys gardening, or planning trips. Um, but you know, some of you may feel that your children or grandchildren uh, use the internet or connected devices more easily and may find it sometimes a struggle to do some of the things that seem kind of ordinary or basic, like checking email. Um, visiting, visiting travel websites, et cetera, um, knowing which sites are safe to visit, um, how to bank safely. Um, some of that can be explained by a couple terms they've come up with in the, recently. 
And one of those is if you were born before the internet, you know, today's cyber world, like myself, we are considered digital immigrants. Um, and so that means it's something that's kind of new to us and it wasn't part of our lives as we were growing up. So it may still feel pretty unfamiliar and odd to try to navigate that space. And then there are those individuals who came after the internet became commonplace, like my children, where they're considered digital natives. It's integrated into their daily lives. And in some cases, you even see people growing up, kids growing up with it, you know, as soon as they're toddlers, they're getting exposed to internets, internet devices. Um, so today's focus is gonna be on some key areas such as safe online interactions and device safety. So we're gonna start with some basic terms around surfing the internet. Just like you won't ride in a car today without wearing a seatbelt or ride your bike without a helmet, uh, you also shouldn't venture online without taking some basic precautions. Um, learning about some of the existing threat threats will help you enjoy a safer and happier internet experience. And we're going to go over some of these things you'll see here on the slide more in depth later in the uh, workshop, uh, but you'll be hearing about them while going through this presentation. Um, so we're going to start with malware, which is a two words kind of merged together, it stands for malicious software. And malware is used to gain access to your computer. You may have heard the term virus. Um, these programs are harmful for your computer. They're harmful computer programs written intentionally to create havoc, cause damage, you know, to you know, perform some sort of criminal act. They are designed to spread themselves from one computer to another through the internet. And most commonly they're designed so that one computer is, uh, gives access to another computer so they can steal personal information. Phishing is an attempt to steal financial or personal information by pretending to be someone else. So what they're hoping to do is to trick you into clicking a malicious link or opening a malicious attachment. And then the cloud describes a remote service where you can store your information, such as your documents and pictures. Microsoft provides a service, Amazon, uh, Google, and HP and most of the big uh, internet technology companies have some sort of cloud service where companies and individuals can use a remote service to store information. And the advantage of this is it'll free up space on your computer. You know, as we collect more videos and, and pictures and you know, shortcuts and other files and documents, you know, our computers are limited in space or phones are limited in space. This is another tool that many can use both professionally and personally to store that information. Wi-Fi, which many of you have at home, um, or you can access when you go stay at a hotel, the airport or a coffee shop. Um, Wi-Fi is a wireless internet access that you use typically with a portable device like a phone, laptop, or a tablet. Um, so um, often you're using it to download information, a website, or maybe a program. Um, so if you are downloading something out of your phone, like a game or social network, you're downloading an application which is the last icon there, or commonly referred to as an app. So we're gonna go on to maybe the most poss possibly the most single important thing you can remember today. And that is about how to protect yourself from malware. And it's called antivirus. There are a lot of different options for antivirus out there you can use. Um, there are free options and there are paid versions and the free ones can be very good, um, but they won't always have some of the advanced features that you want. Microsoft provides one within their operating system called Defender. Um, I don't know if Apple provides the same, but I'm, I'm most familiar with Microsoft products. Uh, but you know, you can get a free one, it's still a good option for malware protection. Your computer may have come with it when you bought it, especially more recently, it usually comes with a, a trial period, like for example, maybe McAfee or Symantec are some common names you may have heard. Um, or you can buy it separately when you buy your computer from the store, or you can go to the store and just buy that software like you uh, would buy anything else from an electronics store. But having the antivirus software isn't enough. Just having that on your computer, you have to also keep it updated. Um, much as you may have seen Microsoft uh, update programs like the operating system on your computer, your antivirus also has to be updated. And this will fix problems with the software, but also brings it up to date with some of the more recent or newer threats. And what I recommend and is highly recommended by the industry is that you set these updates to be automatic. So they run while you're using your computer. You can also set it up so it runs outside of those times you're using it if your computer's on. 
uh, because if your computer becomes infected and you can't get rid of the malware, um, you may end up having to reinstall your computer software. Um, you could end up losing data or have to rebuy software or even an operating system. It could cost several hundred dollars for this. And so this is one of the reasons why, you know, antivirus kind of pays for itself. When you look at the cost of these programs, this is the savings you could benefit from by having this on your laptop, desktop, et cetera. And uh, when it comes to backing up your data, we'll, I'll go into more depth into that later on in the workshop. But the bottom line is keep it updated and keep all your programs updated because those two in combination are some of the best ways you can protect yourself against malware. When you're updating your programs, you know you have your operating system that you need to update. That's whether it's your phone, your tablet, or your home computer. Don't forget your browsers. Those come out with updates. Often they'll have an alert, a, a symbol or something that'll pop up in a corner of your browser, let you know that there's an update available. Uh, the new Microsoft Edge has, I believe, an orange circle with an arrow that catch your eye. And that's when you click on that, it'll let you know that there's an update available. Uh, your word processors, you know, Microsoft Office, et cetera, those come with updates. Um, uh, your tax software, I use a financial planning, financial management software, and I get prompted every couple of weeks to update that. So don't put those off. Be prompt with those. Um, you can schedule them again to run automatically and just follow the instructions when it appears before you on your computer. Um, Rick? Yes. Real quick, um, there's a question from Bonnie asking, is there malware out there that pretends to be antivirus? Do we need to be cautious when looking into antivirus software? Yeah, and I'll go back. I'll, there's actually a section of that later on in the, the workshop, but yes, because you have to remember, they only have to be right once, and they're always looking. When I say they, I mean uh, the bad people, the criminals, the bad actors, um, the hackers, which... It's kind of an old term to use, but either way, anybody is trying to cause you harm or steal information, they're looking for as many different ways as they can to trick you into releasing information to them, steal information from you, steal money from you, et cetera. And so you have to, they're, it's, a, it's amazing how creative they can be, but yes. So, uh, Along with updating your software, it's also important to create safe passwords. Um, often you hear of a company uh, or some other industry that's been affected by hacking. Uh, people are hacked every day through, because of bad passwords or stolen information, but typically it's due to a poor password, um, poorly written password, a password is used too many times and it can be used across multiple websites. Um, we have lots of passwords nowadays we have to remember. For those of us that started with the internet before it became well known, we had one or two passwords. It may have been just a simple word. And then we could use that same one. You know, to date myself, we used to have a Rolodex where we would store our passwords as we realized they were becoming too numerous to remember. Um, you know, password complexity is getting bigger. You know, 12 to 16 passwords with different characters and numbers. Um, but one technique you can try to use to create strong passwords because they're not gonna get any shorter is going with something called a passphrase, which is a technique for creating and remembering passwords using a combination of words. It could be a saying, it could be a lyric from a song, um, but you put all those letters and numbers together and then you're on your way to creating what's considered a password, but it's often more easy to remember. What you don't want to do is use passwords that may have been affected from previous breaches. So if you were a user of a site, and even worse, if you were notified that your information was compromised, that password you used at that time, you should have changed it by now. And also, it goes without saying, but please don't reuse it. Don't use dictionary words, because there's programs out there that actually take words out of the dictionary and just push them over and over again at websites, trying to find a password that works because people do this. Um, using sequential repetitive characters such as all A's or one, two, three, four, five, six. Because again, the hackers, the criminals, they write programs and they're prolific out there that actually go into websites and just run these against them. Context specific words like the name or purpose of a site 
you know, that's requiring the password. So like using, for example, if you're like me, an REI customer, using REI in your password is not a good idea because it the programs that they write incorporate that into their password cracking attempts. And don't ever share your passwords. Uh, use passwords on your lock screens for your mobile devices and computers and lock those when you walk away. Set them to have short times from when they lock. It can be frustrating, but unfortunately, the world's changing and we need to adopt these new habits. As soon as you get up from your computer, it's especially when you're not at home and someplace safe, lock your screen, turn off power down, put your computer to sleep or your laptop or tablet, lock it. So that way you make sure that it, your information is safe when you're looking the other way. When considering all the passwords we have to use these days and um, try to remember, there is an option where there's software out there now that we can purchase. Some of it is free. Um, I use a, per I use a per version that I purchase every year. It's like a subscription that stores my passwords for me. Um, there's probably three or four or five different companies that come to mind. Um, Dashlane, LastPass, OpenPass, I think is one. They, they all are, have subtleties and their differences in the services they provide, but they're all very good options for storing your passwords and your secret questions. Um, just make sure it's a legitimate company. Sometimes you can find resources that have reviewed them like Consumer Reports or other legitimate companies that have gone and can give you some advice on you know, the differences between them and what to pick. You'll have to select a master password for these, these the software, these applications. Make sure that's long and secure and complex. But the good thing is don't share this and it'll be the one password you need to remember to then access your, your dictionary, your own trove of passwords. They use very advanced encryption techniques to keep your passwords safe. So you just gotta remember, don't forget your password because uh, typically they don't let you unlock it. It's one of the ways that they ensure that your information stays safe is if you forget that master password, you'll probably have to start over to resetting your passwords. Um, and the nice thing about these is you can incorporate them into your browser. So when you log on to, a, when you visit a website you wanna log on to, a lot of times they recognize the website, they match that to a set of credentials you have in the application, and they'll offer to fill it in for you, the username and the password, and then you can just log in from there. Uh, when you're using open Wi-Fi, you have to remember that Wi-Fi is, is uh, prone to interception. Um, so think twice and use caution when you're using free coffee shop or hotel internet. Never set your devices to auto connect to open wireless because uh, you, can, you can look at these settings in your device and you can change these on your, uh, on your device. If you need help, there's professionals out there, the uh, cellular phone, uh, companies that can help you with that, as well as friends and family that can probably help you. And then there's YouTube videos, et cetera, on the internet that can talk you through how to turn those settings off. But you know, if you're going to be checking for the closest restaurants or directions to a, a hotel or a park using the Wi-Fi, that's fairly innocent. And there's not any sensitive information that you're typically sharing. But if you're considering accessing email, banking information or something like that, or even shopping, uh, and using an open Wi-Fi, I would caution against that. Now, I'd wait till you get home or to do that purchase to access that site. That way you know you're on a trusted known site. Uh, because a lot of these can be, when they're put out there, they're given a name very similar to the free one that's in the business you're visiting in order to trick you into selecting that. And then they just collect that information as it goes through their computer. And you'd hate for that to happen to you. If you're using a free Wi-Fi service and they provide a username and a password, that is typically safer because they're giving you that information. So that is how they can control some of the safety of the Wi-Fi they're providing, but it's not always secure. So I always take it with a grain of salt, better be safe than sorry. And again, do any banking, email, or other financial transactions from home or another known safe Wi-Fi connection. If you are visiting websites that you need to check if they're, they're secure um, and you're gonna be transferring or sharing or accessing personal information, bank numbers, credit cards, et cetera, there's some things you can look at when you're visiting the website. 
Um, you may have seen this already, and may be familiar with these two, two of these things. One of them is the S behind the HTTPS up there in the left corner. That S means for secure. You have unsecure and secure access to a web page. Uh, most sites nowadays have gone to the option where they automatically create a secure connection, but not all of them. You're definitely your financial institutions, your email, if you're buying anything online, it's almost a given that those will have an, be a secure uh, connection. Often you'll also see a lock or something that looks like a padlock in the vicinity, either to the left or the right of the address. That also lets you know that that site that you're visiting, that page on that site is secure. They're using secure encryption between your web computer and the website. Um, you can look around the site, check to see if something looks strange. If it's, you know, looks like the site you visited before, does it look the same? Because they go through, they go to great length to copy the existing sites and mimic them. So when you visit them, it's hard for you to tell because you're not looking for those, those differences. Are the pictures missing? Are the pictures incorrect or seem off from what you're looking at? Are there errors in spelling? Um, is there something that should be there that looks like a software code that's typically an, an ad or another product? Um, so just make sure also you can double check the spelling. Um, so for example, here we have www.yourbank.com. Um, they may swap, drop the W and O and put you are bank and maybe even add an E after bank.com and then create the website that looks the same. And as humans, we kind of skip spelling errors and we might miss that misspelling in the URL. But if we slow down and take another peek at that, we often can notice that this common tactic to spell the website address differently, we can catch that and protect ourselves by observing that. Again, reiterating to use strong, unique passwords for your financial sites or anywhere that you're gonna enter credit card information. I recommend you don't store your credit card information on any websites because then if those websites you know, admit to having a data breach, there's some assurance that while you may have some personal information on there, perhaps at least maybe your financial information wasn't included in that breach. Do not use the same password again for your know, multiple sites because once criminals figure it out, they'll use it on other sites to try to gain access to your information. Uh, finally, remember that banks never ask for your password and for financial information via email. If you receive any emails or are contacted for this information and you haven't contacted your bank, you're actively working with them for something that's financially related, it's probably a phishing attack. And if you're not sure, just let them know, you'll get back to them and pull up the phone number that you hopefully have saved for your bank or financial institution or the company that you're uh, shopping with and call them directly and find out if that's the case because they should be then be able to pull up your account information and let you know if it's true or not because you can never be too cautious. And I'm gonna divert here just a little bit and give you a little uh, personal experience. Early this year, I was a victim of wire fraud. And if I had slowed down, and taking the time to call the company I was working with to verify, verify this, I could have stopped it right at the get-go because a criminal injected themselves into an email communication chain over the weekend and sent me some new financial information for a payment I was to make. Um, fortunately, because I acted fast and I'll cover some steps you can take, remained calm, I was able to recover that money. But I share that also to let you know that even those of us in the industry those of us that have this information and maybe read about this or deal with this on a daily or weekly basis can still become victim. So it's important not to feel any shame, feel shameful, shame of yourself, embarrassed or guilty. It's important that you recover your, your senses, regroup and take immediate actions to try to rectify and resolve the, the mistake and then share what you learned so others can learn from you because the more we share, and then hopefully others will learn from, like in my case, my mistake and not let it happen to them. Some of the scams that you may have seen, because there's many of them out there, um, are listed here on this screen. You've likely seen them, maybe received some yourself or heard of others being affected by them. Hopefully they haven't become victim, but unfortunately too many people do. And one of the reasons that these scams persist is because of what I mentioned before, is many individuals feel ashamed or embarrassed that they became victim of this. 
And so they don't say anything. They don't reach out for help. They don't reach out to law enforcement. And this is true for many elderly because they feel like because they're elderly, you know, it's going to look more poorly upon them that this happened to them. And so it's important that we do what we can to get past that feeling of shame or embarrassment, reach out for help and communicate what happened to as many people as we feel comfortable communicating to so we can spread the word. So the cold calling scam is where somebody will reach out to you by phone or internet pretending to be from a reputable company such as Amazon, Dell, HP, and they say they notice something wrong with your computer. Um, they're calling because, hey, they wanna fix it, but they just need you to give them access to your computer. And they'll coordinate a way to give you a link that you'll click on because then what they wanna do is take control of your, your electronic device and then they start stealing your information. If you receive one of these calls, hang up. If you get approached by text or a message to their social media or another social app, just ignore it, close it, cancel it, delete it, block it. You don't need to explain to yourself. You don't need to argue with them. You don't need to be kind and polite with them. Just hang up the phone. If, excuse me, if they call you, you can go and block the number and your cell phone provider can help you learn how to do that if you don't know how to do it already. Ransomware has been in the news too much lately. And this is where there's malware installed on a computer device that prevents you from using that computer device, prevents you from accessing your files until you meet certain demands, such as then typically sending money to the individual, to the criminal. It can affect your PC from an email attachment or through a website. Um, the scam is meant to scare you into doing something um, they may claim that they know about something illegal that you did with your PC, found something on your PC that you may not want other people to see, like photos, et cetera, and that you're, or that you're being fined by the police force or government agency that they've contacted. And so you have to remember these claims are false, and it's part of a scare tactic to try to make you react. Because what they know about human nature is the faster they can get you to think, the more likely you are to act in their favor. And it's when we slow down and take a break, reread things, take a step back, that we can often protect ourselves, defend against this. Um, the malware, excuse me, the malware, malware prevents you from accessing your operating system because it encrypts your files. And they'll often say that they have a key they'll give you, but until you pay, they're not gonna give you that key. These applications will stop running. And sometimes it can be very deep in your computer and very hard to get out. And honestly, there's no guarantee they, that the key they give you, if you do pay, will encrypt, unencrypt some of your equipment information, uh, much less all of it. So paying the fine may not be in your interest. Um, prevention is the best defense. Your antivirus, keeping your software updated. I recommend, we recommend you don't pay the fines. You can disconnect your computer from the internet while you're working through this issue. Um, you can run your antivirus software if you're able to access your operating system. And don't forget to contact the police, especially if you're deceived into paying fines. In my case, I filed a, a report with the local police department and the FBI also has a website you can go to where you can file a report. I contacted my bank, I contacted the receiving bank and all of them had different fraud detection and fraud services that they provided that and responded to my needs. And I do believe that my response within the first several hours of learning about this played a key role in recovering my money. Um, excuse me. If you can't unencrypt your computer, you may have to have your computer restored to a point before this happens, or worst case scenario, that you're gonna have to maybe have all your software reinstalled. And this is where the cloud can be a handy tool to have to back up your information. Advanced, ski, ski, uh, advanced fee scams. Many of us has probably gotten these emails where the scammer is helping, they're asking us to help them get some money. And if we do that, we'll be rewarded. Usually it's an extremely large sum of money, often in the millions. But first we have to send them money so that they can initiate this action, which then it will result in them receiving this large sum which they claim that they will share with you. And that's false. 
stranded traveler scam. This is where you may receive a call, a text, or an email claiming to be somebody you know um, that has had something happen to them and they need money to assist them get out of this uh, unfortunate situation. Um, this is an attempt to kind of play on your emotions, which is intentional, which is why they pretend to be a family member or a friend. And they'll maybe say that their wallet was stolen or that their car broke down or that they missed a flight and that they're stuck someplace. And if you can send them some money, then they can get their car running, get a new flight, you know, or get a taxi home, et cetera. If you encounter something like this, it's always best to just call the person directly, hang up, call them directly and verify. Because unfortunately too often the cases, it is not them. They're not in trouble. They don't need help. They're not stranded and they didn't lose their wallet. The saying used to be accept and ver accept but verify. But nowadays you have to switch that and you have to put the verify in front. Always verify first. And once you've verified, then if it's safe to, you can accept. If you start to become the victim of a scam or feel like you are, as I've been saying, try to collect your thoughts and remain calm. Um, if you need to go back and change your passwords for any account that you believe may be infected or may have been compromised. Some of the password managers can assist you with this and they'll create new strong passwords for you. Um, list any information and all information you believe that was stolen or you unknowingly gave to the criminal because you're going to hopefully share the with law enforcement. You're going to track communications, especially if you're still communicating with them and they're still trying to exploit you. So for example, save those emails, obtain and review a copy of your credit report or, credit or confidential financial records. You can even place freezes and blocks on them for periods of times. And that information is available on the credit card reporting sites. Notify your credit card companies and banking institutions about the situation because then they will advise you. They have professionals that are there to help work you through the situation. And then contact your law enforcement. In my case, I was contacted by a detective from our local police department. I provided him copies of the email, contact information for the individual banking institutions that I've been working with, and they took it from there. Because these scammers are criminal, and what they're doing is against the law, and we need to do what we can to try to prosecute them and bring them to justice. Safe email habits include always be cautious when opening email, even if it's from somebody you know or an organization you trust. Um, more often than not, nowadays, the advice is, even if there's a link in the email from somebody you trust, you should always go to the website and visit the website directly as opposed to clicking the link. Um, you can sometimes use your antivirus software to check attachments before you open them. So learning how to use those features is helpful. Some tips for reviewing website links and emails include hovering over the website URL in the email, and it'll show you where it will take you if you click on it. And often you can see if it's a legitimate URL or one that's been misspelled. And you'll, a lot of times you'll see it's not even, doesn't even include any words or letters that relate to the website that it's trying to get you to think you're visiting. So you just hover your mouse pointer over it. You don't click and it'll present it to you. Now, I will add that Microsoft has a new feature where they add a bunch of extra information to the, uh, the URL and it makes it hard to find. Um, you can find it in there. Sometimes you can copy and paste that into a Word document and you can read and try to hunt that out. It's pretty sophisticated, but it is possible. Um, the basic point I'm trying to make here though is avoid clicking on website links directly from emails. Too often than not, is it gonna take you someplace bad? Remember all of your email is stored somewhere on some server, somewhere in the world. And that even though you may have deleted an email from your account, it may still exist with the person that you sent the email to, or it may be on a server somewhere that the email transited through. So you don't wanna send personal information through email, uh, whether it's to family, friends, business, et cetera. That should always be handled verbally or in a secure website. So don't follow links from unknown or untrusted sources. Be careful about what personal information you share. 
Don't reply to posts or emails when asking for personal information. Don't send sense information through email and log out when you're finished, especially in public places. A lot of times you'll have websites that have timers that based on inactivity of five to 10 to 15 minutes, they'll log you out. But that should be a safety measure, not something that you rely upon. Phishing is a malicious attempt. You know, a person trying to pose as a bank, a lawyer, a widow, or perhaps somebody who's sick that's asking for your help with money, maybe an inheritance, or maybe validating your password, or even something as odd as lottery winnings. Um, people lose thousands of dollars a year to these scams. They can be very deceptive and be very convincing. So just remember, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Nothing is free. And again, your bank does not need you to confirm passwords or credit card numbers via email for your security. They will call you about that. Or you'll log in to their website that you visit before and you can confirm it there and they'll ask you to confirm it within their website. Here's an example of a phishing email. And some of the things you can look at as you're trying to study an email to see, is this a legitimate request? You can look for typing, you know, uh, uh, punctuation and spelling errors. For example, the hello has no comma. How it says in the first sentence there, the account will be changed on February 1, hurry. We know that people don't speak English like this typically, much less type in this manner. So there's clues. Um, the attachment, new password. Why would they attach a password to this letter? Open it now to view. Um, if you see that there's a URL, www.yourbank.com, and here it's meant to give a demonstration how when you hover over it, the URL appears. And what you see there is that actually it's not your bank.com is where it'll take you. And that's what I was referring to about hovering your mouse over the URL to see where it takes you to. And then the final thing that's at the last sentence here is the urgency. Urgency is a great tool for criminals to get people to act. So by putting that hurry and hurry up and do this now or we will block your account, creates some concern for many people and they may inadvertently start acting on what this email asks, asks them to do. Don't trust anything, especially if you're not expecting it. Delete these emails, don't open the attachments, don't respond to them asking for clarification. Again, reiterating, your bank will not ask you for login information or account information through an email. If it's coming from somebody that you know, even a family member, it may be possible that their email account was compromised or hacked. They'll try any means necessary to get to trick you. So if you're not sure, contact this person. Criminals may use a pop-up, and this goes back to the question about um, whether people may use antivirus as a um, false screen to get you to um, take action and install software that is actually malware. And you may, you may see pop-ups on some sites you visit that are malicious, and they make you believe your computer has become infected. These are not actual warnings from your computer. It takes a lot of experience with the software to be able to recognize these from the get-go, and again, they're designed to be very believable. Real antivirus does not have a URL across the top. Don't click on these, just close them, close your browser. And if you had one of these pop up and you have any concern, you can go ahead and just use your antivirus and run a scan of your device. There's another one from a micro, excuse me, uh, an Apple OS. Backing up your data, it's extremely important, but easy to do. You can back it up externally to a hard drive. You can back it up to the cloud. Um, a lot of our devices are coming nowadays where they offer this as part of the setup process. For example, iPhone allows you to back up your data to the cloud. It can be limited in its size. So you need to like just recognize that if you have a 64 gigabit phone, they may only allow you to back up five gigabits without for free, and you have to pay for their monthly service to increase that amount. Microsoft often has a terabyte that comes with their 
uh, O365. And when our computers are maybe 500 gigs, then that usually is enough to back up our information. Keep in mind that not all information is backed up. So it behooves you to learn what's being backed up and how often, because you can set it for daily, weekly, or monthly. So a cloud service can be handy for this, or you can purchase an external hard drive. The thing there is you have to remember to connect your hard drive. You don't have it connected all the time to run that backup service. Well, operating systems such as Windows have a, a feature within that will back up these files for you, um, but they do build up over time. So make sure that your storage device is big enough to retain those backups, because it may keep two or three backups. And if you have 500 gigabytes of data that you're backing up, but you only have a one terabyte which is 1,000 gigabyte hard drive, after two cycles, it'll be full. So you might need to get two to five or more. So that way you don't have to sit there and manage and go back in and, and delete those backups. But maybe once every once or twice a year, you can go back in and go, I don't need that backup from you know four backups ago. And the other advantage of that is if you make a mistake and your computer or device becomes infected, then you'll have your important information backed up. You have hopefully an image or other uh, resource to go to, to recover your data and your programs. One of the greatest things about the internet is the fact that it can bring us endless entertainment, especially during these COVID times. It's, uh, I'm sure a lot of us have been binging on movies and TV shows through any number of different sites. Um, just to make sure that you're going to sites that are reputable, NBC, Netflix, Hulu, Etc. Apple TV, use brand name sites. Never search the internet for music or movies or download them because what you may find in the results can be extremely dangerous, it may include malware that when you download it, it infects your computer. And there's also the legal ramifications because you're downloading copyrighted material, or other intellectual property and not paying for it. Social media sites, are a wonderful way to stay in, stuck, stay in touch with people. I relied upon Facebook heavily when I lived overseas for my family to keep up with my kids as they grew in our travels around the world. Um, but I've also kind of strayed away from Facebook in the last several years because what goes on the internet stays on the internet. Even though you delete the post, it may not ever really be deleted from the internet because who knows who also has that on their social media feed or has downloaded that. Um, don't post personal information on social media or sensitive information. You may have heard people are posting pictures of their COVID cards. We don't recommend that. If you're gonna post pictures of people, get their permission first, because they may not want their photos on there. Some people are very protective of that personal information, especially if it's their children. So you know, be kind and get permission first. Um, some of the things you can do for a safe picture of posting include you know, thinking what information contained in this photo, what appears to be innocent may actually give a lot of information about yourself, may reveal where you live, which then could reveal an answer to a secret question. There may be a car plate in there, which then can be used to create a false document. You may have information about your children or your grandchildren's school, which also could then be the answer to a secret question. Street signs tell where you live, school jerseys tell where you went to school, high school, et cetera, which is what was your high school? What was your high school mascot? Posters in the background may indicate some of your favorite movies. Um, all this information can be collected and gleaned from the internet. So be careful what you post. Posting when you're on vacation lets people know that you're gone. It reveals that nobody's home. The other thing to know about, if you haven't heard of this before, is called geotagging. And geotag is the process where the exact information, excuse me, the exact geographic location of where a picture was taken is embedded into the picture. And this requires a GPS, which is in most of our smart devices like our phones and our tablets. And nowadays, many of our cameras have this information. While this can be very handy, and we want to try to remember where a photo was taken, when you post this online, that information is included and can be taken and perhaps used in a criminal way. So you can disable this and you can work with your instructions for your device. If it's a mobile device, your cell phone um, com company can help you figure out how to turn those off for when you're taking photos. 
What you want to make sure that you don't do is turn it off for some of the more important features like emergency services. Nowadays, our cell phones aren't, you know, our phone numbers aren't tied to our homes like they were back in the day. So when we call emergency services, our address doesn't show up automatically. But now they figured out some tools and, and ways to go get around that. And that's using our GPSs in our phones to provide geolocation information. So we don't wanna disable that. Also, you may have it enabled for your children or family members if they're out and about, so if you can see where they're at. So just understanding that disabling it for your photos should not disable it for these other features and knowing that there are separate selections that you can make and keeping those in mind when you go through the process. And again, your cell phone provider can assist you with that. So some of the top tips I covered today, think before you click, get antivirus and keep it up to date to include your software. Make sure your devices are up to date, back up your information such as pictures and documents, use strong unique passwords and consider using a password manager. A passphrase is a useful tool for creating unique strong passwords. Be careful when using public Wi-Fi, open Wi-Fi, and don't use it for financial information, email, et cetera, payments. Uh, question what you see in emails and pop-ups, oh, you know, always a bit of leeriness. Download and stream only from authenticated trusted sites. Don't post sensitive information on social media. And just be mindful of email and email and phone call fraud attempts. Too many people out there are trying to steal our information or steal our money. So that was a lot of information to go through. I hope I didn't go too fast for you, um, but I do appreciate your time. And um, unfortunately, I, I don't have a clock in front of me, but I think we saw, oh, 1147. I think we have a few minutes for questions if people would like to ask any. Okay, that was excellent. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, there's a couple of questions that have popped into the chat. Um, Kate was asking if you should have a separate email for your financial institutions. That is a great question. And it's something that I, I adopted and implemented myself um, a couple of years ago. I do have that. Um, you know, I grew up first mostly using Hotmail and then as I left the military, I learned that Google Mail, Gmail was more common. So I shifted there, but I have Apple products. And with my Apple products, I also have an email account that I can use. So what I've chosen to do is I've chosen to use one of those solely for that kind of, uh, uh, for those purposes. And this way that keeps it separated to include my, any verification emails for logons, go to those email addresses I rarely use those for anything else. And that's been a good technique to keep that separated. Great question. Awesome. Okay, another question from Catherine was, is antivirus embedded in other software or does everyone need a separate antivirus program? Like uh, maybe she's asking every device? You can't always count on devices having antivirus. Um, typically and historically, it's been our laptops you know, on our desktop PCs that have had antivirus. But, you know, companies have come to learn and appreciate that our mobile devices could also benefit from antivirus. Um, now, depending upon the kind of product you use, Apple products, um, you can get antivirus software, but Apple has a pretty stringent security program for their applications. Um, but Android products, if you look through the news, you'll probably see more often than not articles about various um, Android, which are from Google, Android um, products being victims or, or at risk of various uh, malware. And so those would benefit greatly from an antivirus program. Now those do typically come at an added cost and antivirus companies often bundle these. Um, they can either bundle them by the number of users they can bundle them by the number of different devices that you want to use it on. So it's worth looking into that. Does that answer your question? I hope so. <laughs> um, okay, so there's another question about VPNs. Janet wants to know about VPNs. Right, so VPNs are a great tool, a virtual private network. My password manager offers a VPN as part of their paid service. 
And the way a VPN works briefly is what it does, it creates an encrypted connection between your computer and another server, which is then becomes your access point to the internet. And what this does is that ensures that whatever information comes into your computer first comes from through this server, gets encrypted. And this is an additional security layer that you can use when you're trying to maybe access your bank, access your pay for something through a website as you're shopping. Um, I don't commonly use these at home, but I can, but I definitely would use them when I'm out maybe traveling and I'm using the hotel internet um, or a coffee shop. I'll, I even created a reminder for myself to that pops up, that prompts me to use the VPN when I'm out and about. Um, so you can turn these features on even on your mobile devices. When you go into settings um, and type in VPN, you find that you do have an option. If you have a VPN service, you can enable that. Excellent. Uh, there's a couple more questions here. Uh, Amaret's wondering about um, fraud sent through text. Yes. So there's a lot of fraud that comes through texting. You know, if your phone number has been collected through a compromise, um, like I have a phone number that I created when I lived overseas, it was a virtual phone number. And unfortunately, that's been harvested in a couple of data breaches. And so I get a lot of phone calls. Um, and sometimes you can get texts for people wanting to reach out to you. And they may even send you links in those text messages. If you're not expecting those, obviously don't click on them, delete them, ignore them. You can block them. If you're not sure, because it appears to be somebody that you do business with or a friend or family member, again, contact them. Um, you may hear so about some worst case scenarios where they may try to ch change the phone number that goes where your phone number goes to a different card. It's called SIM swapping, pretty complex, probably not something that we need to go into here, but if you wanna read more about it, you can research that and look that up in the news about SIM, SIM swapping. Um, and that's usually where they try to trick you or get your text messages that confirm your login to another website to go to a different phone. It's pretty sophisticated. Um, and for those of us that don't, aren't in the spotlight, aren't CEOs, um, perhaps don't shop with Bitcoin, it's, it's probably unlikely we'll be a victim of those, but you can certainly educate yourself on the dangers of uh, criminals using text messages to take advantage of us. All right, and then our last question is um, from Chris. She says uh, she backs up in the cloud, but she has a friend who is concerned about the security of the cloud. There's nothing wrong with being secure, uh, turned with the security of the cloud. Um, unfortunately, if it's not within the walls of our home or in a safe deposit box, right, then there's still always a chance that something could be compromised. Now, having said that, depending upon what service she uses, you know, being in IT myself, a lot of our larger companies in America also do business with the government. And as a result, to meet the government standards, they have to have some very high security standards. They have to meet some very high security standards in order to um, work with and deal with secret information. Now, they don't always have to meet that same level of security for our personal information, but many times they do meet that same level. And you can visit their website to find out how they do that. Um, because typically the information is compromised if we don't use a good password or we share it with somebody and we send it through an email or something like that. And that's what ends up being the problem. Not so much because the information has been compromised at the cloud provider. Websites can be compromised, but generally our cloud providers work very hard to keep that information safe, but they're not impervious. Um, this, last, this last year, this, this COVID year, there's been some pretty big breaches that have happened because they've just gotten really sophisticated and creative. You have countries, and you have groups of criminals that work very hard to try to find some very creative ways to get inside an organization. So there's still always that chance. And it's a risk you have to decide for yourself if you're willing to accept. Yeah, lots of bad guys out there. Um, Jean had a question. Uh, and Jean, I'm going to have you unmute yourself because I'm not a 100% I, oh, where'd she go? Oh, I just saw her. 
Um, she has a question about message websites. There she is. Jean, could you go ahead and unmute yourself? Oh. Go ahead. Oh, oh you're still muted. <laughs> oh, Jean, I'm sorry. You're still muted. There. Okay. Sometimes a website will say, um, website not secure. Or what does it say? Yeah. Web, not like secure. A, like a Wi-Fi. A Wi-Fi. Now, is that, should we just not go there? If you remember earlier, I was talking about what you're using the internet for should then help you decide if you want a secure or unsecure connection. If I'm looking up prices for tickets to Hawaii and it says website's not secure, if I'm not buying those tickets, if I'm just shopping for that information, then it's probably okay. If I'm visiting the Smithsonian because I'm helping my son look up information about a history, historical event, and it says website not secure. But if I'm attempting to buy something or I'm attempting to log into my email or my bank and I get that message, then I wanna stop right there because then something is wrong because that should be a secure connection. Because like I said in the beginning, it's becoming more commonplace, luckily, that websites will automatically create a secure connection with you. It used to be more common that they would be unsecured connection until you wanted to do something like buy something, pay for something, et cetera, or look at information that was confidential or sensitive. But now with all the scams, all the criminals, it's become uh, like better practice to have your internet connection, your websites create a secure connection. So just evaluate what you're doing and decide, do I need a secure connection for this? Am I just visiting the library to look for books, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, and it's not secure then? Or am I trying to do something that has sensitive information, then stop, close it, start over, or even call the, the organization to find out more about why you might have a unsecure connection there? Yeah, that answers it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Dean. Okay, and then the last one, since it's 1157 um, from Jocelyn, she wants to know if she should shut down her computer every night. I don't know if you need to shut down your computer every night, um, depending upon you know, what you know about what it's doing. The advantage to shutting it down at night is um, you, we get updates regularly, and if you have them running automatically, then any work we're doing, we've closed as when we were ready to close it. So like if you're like my wife, who uh, is often researching gardening sites, um, she might want to save those to favorites versus going back through the history. So if she closes those you know, at her own pace, she can save them as she needs to and then shuts it down. And then the update runs without being a nuisance for her. But um, leaving your, turn your computer off at night is a good habit, but I wouldn't necessarily describe it as necessary, especially if you're on a secure network and your password protecting your computer. Excellent, Rick, that was awesome. Thank you so much. I'm gonna help, go ahead and let everybody unmute themselves. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah, everybody can unmute and say thank you to Rick for the great talk today. Okay. Hope you enjoyed the information and I hope it found it useful. I hope it wasn't too much too fast, but you can see there's a lot out there that poses a threat. So best of wishes to you. Enjoy the rest thank of your you. week. And thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. For your, thank you, thank you for the work you're doing. Yes. It's very important. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.